Right now, tens of thousands of Russian troops are massing for an offensive to reclaim territory from Ukraine. That's according to Ukraine's military chief. Overnight, the two countries had what appears to be the most extensive exchange of drone attacks of the war, descending on Moscow, on Kyiv, and beyond. It's unfolding, of course, as the world wonders what this war will look like with the return of Donald Trump. The Kremlin is denying a Washington Post report that Trump and Putin spoke last week. That report claimed that Trump warned the Russian leader not to escalate in Ukraine. Joining us now is NBC's Megan Fitzgerald and retired Admiral James Stavridis, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO and MSNBC Chief International Analyst. Thank you both. Megan, adding to all this, uh, Russia has roughly 10,000 North Korean troops potentially fighting alongside them. Give us the latest update. Yeah, so, you know, according to um, Ukrainian President Zelensky, some 50,000 Russian troops are amassed in the Kurtz region, inclusive of those North Korean troops. Now, uh, they're waiting for a counteroffensive from uh, Russia. They haven't yet attacked, but Ukraine is, is preparing for that in the coming days here. Uh, you know, and then look, w what we're going to see is Russia, again, making an attempt to try and take back territory that Ukraine seized during their counteroffensive that we saw launched um, in uh, over the summertime. But here's the thing. We understand that Russia didn't need to restructure and shuffle troops uh, that are fighting in the east, which is a primary uh, focus for them, and, and take them uh, to the Kurtz region. So what we're seeing here is the ability for Russia to launch uh, these offensives and these attacks on two different regions as they push forward to try and take back more land. Thank Chris. you so much for that, Megan Fitzgerald. So Admiral, these latest moves, what do you see happening here? I'm particularly concerned about the addition of these North Korean troops. Um, so far, it's about 10,000, Chris. I think that number actually could grow significantly because Kim Jong-un doesn't care about his troops, doesn't care about his economy. It's a one-trick pony. His only export is combat capability. So look for that number to grow. Here's the good news, such as it is, it'll be hard for the Russians and the North Koreans to operate together. They're not like NATO, where all of those nations have been training and fighting together for decades, really. Uh, they've got language barriers, operational skill barriers, equipment barriers, communication barriers. It's not going to be seamless. But certainly the addition of these North Korean troops is very worrisome. That's what I'm watching most closely. And they really need them, right? I mean, I just saw the U.K. defense yeah. minister saying in the month of October, an average of 1,500 Russian fighters died, were lost every single day. It's costliest month for casualties. So, I mean, we know that the, the, the number of troops that were lost have been very, very high, tough to get exact estimates but the highest so far. Yeah, let me just kind of do the numbers with you. And these are from very reliable sources that I'm cross-fixing between the British, the Americans, the Ukrainians, uh, almost without doubt, 200,000 young Russian males killed, 400,000 grievously wounded, and another 600,000 have left the country, Chris. They departed in order to avoid the draft. And oh, by the way, those are the smart ones, internet savvy, who have some rubles, have contacts in the West. Huge brain drain for Russia. Put it all together, Putin's probably lost a million young men. He's already got a significantly declining population. That's long term a real problem for Putin. So what's he doing? Your point, Chris. He's trying to fill the gap with these North Koreans. It's not a sign of Russian strength. It's a sign of Russian weakness. Meantime, of course, you have uh, the incoming president, Donald Trump, uh, introducing this new level of uncertainty. I mean, really, for both Russia and Ukraine. His son, Don Jr., was taunting Zelensky on social media about losing your allowance. Uh, the Atlantic put it this way. Helping Ukraine is Europe's job now. How do you believe President Trump's return changes the calculations that every side is making right now? I think both sides are going to be thinking more about a negotiation. Zelensky is thinking more about a negotiation because 
he sees the skepticism from Donald Trump, from J.D. Vance, from, I guess, Donnie Jr., although last time I checked, he doesn't make policy. But all of that skepticism has got a way on the Ukrainians and kind of pushed them toward negotiation. On Putin's side, Chris, it's what we discussed a moment ago. It's the huge manpower losses, the need to rely on North Korea. Those aren't long-term very good signs. So I think as a Trump team gets settled in early next year, there'll be pressure on both sides to negotiate. Yeah, and, and maybe Vladimir Putin wants to give uh, Trump what looks like a win, but how do you visualize a realistic peace deal that both sides could agree to? Well, these, again, are decisions for Ukrainians and Russians. Uh, but I think how the balance of forces and influence possibly could come out would be a scenario where, tragically, but realistically, Putin ends up in control of Crimea and the four provinces of Donbass. But the quid pro quo for Ukraine would be 80 percent of Ukraine, therefore, sails on, democratic, free, a path to NATO membership, a path to EU membership, the fighting stops. You could see a scenario like the Korean War, Chris, where there's a kind of thin demilitarized zone, perhaps patrolled on one side by Russia, the other side by Ukraine with some NATO troops, probably not U.S., but European NATO troops. You could kind of see that deal. It'll be a tough negotiation because both Ukraine and Russia will have some serious reservations on both sides about that plan. But that's what a negotiation is. It reflects the reality of the battlefield.